England has gone too far in the direction of Thatcherism. Every single social democratic government or Labour government after the 1980s uh, effectively allowed the financiers to get away with murder. Even if you leave, you won't leave. Uh, you will be embroiled in a permanent negotiation with Brussels for decades to come after Brexit. Five years have now passed since the Brexit vote, with dramatic consequences for both the UK and Europe. To mark that anniversary, we've published a special issue of the magazine this week, in which contributors from across the political spectrum reflect on the consequences of the referendum. They include John Gray, Gary Young, Elif Shafak, Helen Thompson, and Yanis Varoufakis, the former Greek finance minister and the author of books including Adults in the Room, My Battle with Europe's Deep Establishment, and Talking to My Daughter about the Economy. And Yanis joins us today. Yanis, thank you for joining us. It's a great pleasure, George. To start, I wanted to ask you, there's some who take the view that Brexit was inevitable, that it was the UK's destiny to leave the, the EU and the 26 referendum provided the opening for that. Do you agree with that or do you think it's something that could have been avoided? Nothing in history is inevitable. I'm not a determinist. That there was a natural uh, incongruity between the United Kingdom and the European Union. I always believe that, and it's quite evident that that was true, in the sense that um, uh, European continental capitalism and uh, British capitalism were two different kinds of beasts, uh, whereas uh, uh, capitalism in England, in Scotland, in Wales, uh, evolved, emerged spontaneously uh, from the grassroots, so to speak, against the interests and opinions of the landed gentry, uh, the royal family, and so on. In uh, places like Germany and in France, it was imposed from above. So there was always an incongruity. But for me, what really precipitated Brexit was initially the unwise decision by François Mitterrand and Helmut Kohl to create the euro. The euro was always going to create serious ruptures between you know, the EU and the UK, but primarily, the mishandling by Brussels, by Frankfurt, by Berlin, of the uh, 2008 financial crisis, which created um, very strong centrifugal forces, tearing the United Kingdom apart from the European Union. And in particular, you will recall that after 2008, the Bank of England was printing money as if, as if there was no tomorrow to refloat uh, the city of London. Some of it was spilling over into the economy. Whereas at the very same time, the European Central Bank was doing exactly the opposite. It was practicing contractionary contraction. The result was that you know, 3 million Europeans uh, came to Britain uh, and uh, these centrifugal forces were exacerbated. If you add to that the inept campaign in 2016 by Remainers, who were you know, pointing the finger to Brits saying, with the assistance of people like Wolfgang Schäuble, the German finance minister, Christine Lagarde, then the managing director of the IMF, if you dare vote for Brexit, Armageddon is going to hit you. That was like inviting them to vote for Brexit. So it wasn't inevitable, but a series of missteps, primarily by continental Europe, uh, and mainly the awful Remain campaign, gave rise to Brexit. As a Greek finance minister, you're obviously very critical of the, the EU. Um, during the referendum, you campaigned for Remain and reform. Um, why do you think um, that project failed? The answer was given to me by a wonderful old lady, I believe it was in Leeds, uh, during one of my campaign speeches against Brexit. Uh, the audience were, of course, radical leftists, who else will come to listen to me. Uh, uh, she was one of them. She was an old trade unionist. And she came to me at the end of my speech in favor of Britain staying in the EU so that we can, together, all Europeans, uh, fight the establishment from within. And she said, look, Yanis, I, I really like you, but I'm not going to do as you say. I'm not going to vote for Remain. And I asked her why. She said, listen, because, you know, the, next, the day after the referendum, you're not going to be in 10 Downing Street. Jeremy Corbyn is not going to be in 10 Downing Street. It will be David Cameron. And he's not going to do um, uh, what you're suggesting, that is go to Brussels and fight for the democratization of the European Union. He's going to take it as yet another confirmation 
of the crime against uh, the people of Britain that the Tories have been perpetrating for so long. So I'm not going to vote for them. And I think that is the reason. In the end, that explains the 2% difference. Mm. Yes. Unlike the current Labour leader, Keir Starmer, you opposed a, a second referendum. Do you blame that policy for Labour's huge defeat in 2019? Absolutely. Hard Remainers within the Labour Party um, committed a crime against logic. We of the left, whether we are the soft left, the hard left, whichever variety of the left, above all, we are Democrats. The manner in which Hard Remainers treated with contempt those who voted for Brexit was always going to be detrimental to the prospects of the Labour Party, whoever led the Labour Party. I remember, again, before the referendum in 2016, I was having a public debate in London in front of a large audience with Tariq Ali, my friend and great comrade Tariq Ali. And we disagreed on that because Tariq took a Lexit position, a left-wing Brexit position, and I didn't. And I remember he was saying, in all sincerity, he believed it, that um, one of the reasons why he wanted Brexit to win was because it would divide the Tories. And my response was, no, it won't. The Tories are class warriors. They know how to fight the class war. They may loathe one another. They may you know, kill each other over Europe. But when it comes to a general election, when it comes to preserving the interests of the bourgeoisie, of the ruling class, they will unite and they will win against a left that's going to be viciously divided by Brexit. Think of, think of the name they gave it, the people's vote. I mean, that was suicide. What was the first vote? The elite's vote. It's like saying to those in the heartlands that voted for Brexit for the reasons that the lady from Leeds told me, and they were very good reasons. I mean, I disagreed with her, but they were very powerful reasons. It was like telling her that she's an idiot, that she's an uneducated, xenophobic nativist. Now, by calling the second referendum a people's vote and disenfranchising those people who actually voted for Brexit for their own good reasons, Labour was committing suicide and Jeremy Corbyn was being put in a, in a position that was absolutely impossible because he agreed with me. He agreed with what I'm telling you. But the vast majority of his parliamentary party, the majority of the members of the Labour Party, even Momentum, were demanding a second referendum. So, you know, Yet again, the left managed to divide itself, uh, hoping that it would be the right that would be divided, but the right never is divided because they are holding on to uh, all the levers of economic power and they are not going to let go so easily over Europe or actually over anything. One of the aims of the referendum policy announced by David Cameron was to end the Tory Europe wars. He obviously hoped for a different result. But do you think, from a purely party perspective, the device has worked as intended, that the Conservatives are no longer at, at war over Europe as they were in the 1990s and, and onwards? David Cameron uh, was always following a very clear strategy, which was not a bad strategy, all things considered, given the information set that he had when he became Tory leader. The strategy was... Uh, to have an internal agreement between Eurosceptics and Europhiles that, look, uh, we're not going to win government, we're not going to fight each other, we're not going to destroy our government like um, uh, previous Tory administrations did. And what I promise you is that we're going to sort this out by means of a, re a, re a referendum at some point in time. And he hoped that he would win that referendum, he was convinced he would re win that referendum, and that would end the, the whole issue. It would bury this issue. In the end, he lost it, but as you say, uh, unity was achieved because one way, or the other, one way or the other, especially with the purge of the Europhiles uh, by Boris Johnson before the general election 2019, now the Tory party is completely united behind Brexit. There were some leavers who hoped that the UK's departure from the EU would set off, set off a chain reaction of other departures. Why do you think that hasn't proved the case? I always thought that that was uh, pie in the sky. It would never do it. Uh, it, it. Britain was always an outlier within the European Union. And it is 
evident, it was always going to be the case that the great pain that uh, the whole Brexit process creates, and it's evident pain, pain for you know, everyone, from fishermen to um, agricultural uh, sectors and you know, to ex exporters, to importers, that that pain would uh, immediately reduce the popularity of uh, exits in France, in Holland, in Germany, in Austria, in Italy. Uh, create, it would create, as it has created, um, a kind of um, unity, fake unity, within the EU, but at the same time it would fragment the EU in a way that it is not visible to the naked eye. So, seemingly, the European Union has become uh, stronger and ties between EU countries have become uh, more powerful as a result of Brexit in reaction to the pain that Brexit caused. But this gave a false sense of security to the powers that be in the European Union. They are continuing to double down on the policies which lead to the fragmentation under the surface of the European Union. So what I was saying before 2016, the Brexit referendum, I think is now coming to fruition. It's, it's becoming increasingly obvious that you have this paradox. The EU seems to be more cohesive, but under the surface, if you look at debt, at banking, at uh, growth rates, at investment, uh, the fragmentation becomes greater. And the danger that the European Union has is not more, bre kind, not, not more exits like Italexit, Fraxit, Dexit, and so on. No. It is the renationalization of policy, something that the pandemic and COVID-19 exacerbated, uh, and the increasing irrelevance of the EU on the continent. The UK is often spoken of as, as an outlier, but um, there are prominent Eurosceptic movements in, in most major European countries. So in, in, in that respect, do you actually think that the similarities with other countries are, are as notable as the differences? We have to make a very strong distinction between countries that have the euro and countries that don't have the euro. Let me put it differently. If Britain had adopted the euro, if Tony Blair had prevailed upon Gordon Brown and your country had adopted the euro, there would have been no Brexit because the, the pain of extricating yourself from the common currency is gigantic. And if Britain actually left the euro and the European Union, then there would be no European Union left <laughs> to speak of. So in, in that sense, I think we should distinguish between countries like Italy, Greece, Portugal, Ireland that have the euro and countries like Poland, the Czech Republic and so on that don't have the euro. These are very, very different beasts. Um, in the case of Italy, for instance, even though dissatisfaction with the European Union is greater than it was in the United Kingdom, the fact that there would be this kind of um, rupture of unbelievable economic cost, courtesy of the common currency, means that, as William Hague once said quite aptly, the euro is a bit, resembles a house that is on fire but has no fire exit. So even though you're burning inside, there is no, it's very hard to get out, <laughs> yeah. if not impossible. It's not impossible, it's very difficult. And you can see that. You can see that, you know, for instance, the Lega, uh, Salvini's party in Italy, which um, is very Eurosceptic, uh, thoroughly dislike the euro and so on, uh, they have stopped speaking about Italexit. They've stopped speaking about, you know, replacing the euro with uh, a homegrown currency. Uh, but they are gathering strength and their Euroscepticism is becoming... Uh, it's morphing into a xenophobic pan-European party. You, we, we see now moves uh, for Salvini, for the illiberal Democrats, that is the you know, recalcitrant right-wing xenophobic uh, racists and homophobic racists in Poland, in Hungary, in France and so on, to unite, to create a common party in the European Parliament. This is how... Um, the exit tiers within the European Union uh, movement is uh, evolving and it's um, far more dangerous, in my view, 
that they have shed the narrative of exit because this becomes more insidious and actually more misanthropic. Mm. You used to liken the EU to Hotel California that you can check out, but you can never leave. Do you think the UK did manage to leave in the end or do the ongoing rows over the, the Northern Ireland protocol and other areas show that it can never fully escape the EU's grasp? Well, my reference to Hotel California was describing exactly what we're experiencing now. I was saying in those speeches I was giving against Brexit that even if you leave, you won't leave. Uh, you will be embroiled in a permanent negotiation with Brussels for decades to come after Brexit. Uh, so what we see now with the Northern Ireland Protocol is precisely that. For Boris Johnson, the contrast between the UK's rapid vaccine rollouts and the EU's very sluggish one has been um, very politically advantageous. Uh, why do you think Europe was so slow? When I criticised Brussels uh, for lack of democracy, this was not just um, an ideological or ethical criticism. For me, democracy is not a luxury. It's not something nice to have in addition to efficiency. Without democracy, you don't have efficiency. During the good times, when there is no crisis, you can have a dictatorship, you can have a cartel that operates quite efficiently. When the pie is getting larger, when there are benefits to distribute around, uh, despots, bureaucrats and cartels can um, deliver the goods quite straightforwardly. The difficulty comes when you have a crisis. And it is then that democracy is more efficient. The vaccination fiasco of the European Union is a very good example of that. Uh, initially, when the pandemic hit, there was no European Union to speak of. Italy was uh, suffering uh, a terrible ordeal. People were dying. Hospitals were overflowing. There were no protective gear or um, important medicines that were, or oxygen for that matter. And what did Germany and Austria do? They shut their borders and they uh, prevented uh, essential medical equipment from being exported to Italy. So we were not operating like a European Union. At some point, they realized that that was, let's say, um, a mistake, <laughs> to put it mildly. And they decided to do the right thing, which is to say, at least when it comes to vaccines, we're going to procure them centrally and we're going to distribute them on a per capita basis um, equally across the European Union. That was a, the right decision. But Brussels being Brussels, uh, you had a president of the European Commission who was a failed German defense minister chosen by Merkel and Macron behind closed doors to be the president of the European Commission. And she botched the vaccination procurement process magnificently. And this was not just incompetence, it was also corruption. Because, let's face it, uh, Brussels operates along the lines of the German French axis. And the big business German French, French axis. So what they did was they said, okay, we need what 600 million doses. Uh, we will order 300 million from a German company, BioNTech, and another 300 million from a French company, Sanofi. And that, that happened all behind closed doors. There was no policy. There was no the, the, all the processes that you have in London, in in Berlin for that matter, in uh, Madrid. You know, parliamentary processes, select committees, uh, ways of, uh, you know, watching over what the powers that be are doing. Those were not present in Brussels. They did this behind closed doors. The result was that the French company didn't produce any vaccines. And that, you know, the, the contracts that um, Mrs. von der Leyen, the president, the, the most failed president of the European Commission, signed with AstraZeneca were not worth the, you know, the paper that they were written on. Um, and you had this complete catastrophe, a combination of lack of democracy, of incompetence and of corruption. We talked earlier about how the um, Brexit referendum has in some ways worked out rather nicely for the Conservatives. They've won their biggest general election victory since 1987. They've divided Labour and the UK has left the single market and, and, and the customs union. Um, but of course, there's the headache of Scotland which voted 62% remain, where the SNP have won a fourth term in office and where the Scottish government is now demanding 
a second independence referendum. How much of a, a problem do you think that is for the Conservatives? It's a huge problem problem for Britain and uh, for England, for that matter, uh, as well as for Scotland, because the Scots need to answer some very pressing questions as well. Uh, I'm not neither in favour nor against uh, Scottish independence. This is for the people of Scotland to, to decide. But what we see is the effect, the re- negative repercussions of the incomplete devolution of Tony Blair devolving power to Edinburgh as well as to the Welsh was a good idea, of course, but incompleteness was always going to create problems in the future. The greatest problem is England, whereas Scotland and Wales, to some extent, were given a degree of autonomy. Uh, You know, the Scots feel that uh, many of the decisions that affect their lives are determined by their parliament. And they have pride in that, independently of which political party they vote for. Uh, England, however, has no such identity. It has no such way of expressing itself, especially England outside of London and the South East. So you have this situation, 50% of which you described. I believe that the Scottish independence lost the first referendum because of the fear that they wouldn't be able to be in the EU if they voted to be independent, that Spain would uh, veto um, Scotland's entry or re-entry into the EU. And then you have the the Brexit referendum that takes them out (laughs) against their will, out of the EU, and that strengthens um, the independence movement in Scotland. Meanwhile, England, especially North England, is left uh, bereft of any decent representation. And the fact that, you know, Boris Johnson won the red wall seats doesn't mean that these people feel a lot more represented. It was more of a negative reaction to what they considered the elites of the Labour Party than a positive embracement of Boris Johnson's stories. Uh, As far as Scotland is concerned, um, I wish the Scottish people well. If I were a Scot, I, I would probably vote in favor of independence because England has gone too far in the direction of Thatcherism. Looking at England from outside, even though I I love the country, it's very difficult to see how the progressives, who may be in the majority, will get their act together in order to arrest this uh, precipitous fall into the lap of a rabid neoliberal um, way of doing things. Whereas Scotland remained much closer, always remained much closer, to the post-war settlement of a mixed economy, of um, a welfare state. Uh, but the, the, the great problem with Scottish independence is that the SNP is not courageous enough. They are not explaining, they're not, they don't have a proper answer to the question, what are you going to do with your currency? Because I find it preposterous to say that you know, we will continue to have the, the pound, um, even if uh, um, we become independent. This, this makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. You want to have your independence, proclaim your monetary independence as well. And this is much easier to do in Scotland than it was, for instance, for us to do here in Greece. Why? Because the Scots have Scottish pounds in their pockets. You have printing presses in Scotland producing the Scottish pounds. All you need to do is sever the link, the peg of one Scottish pound to one English pound. But that takes a little bit of, you know, courage that um, I don't believe that the SNP is showing at the moment. Do you think if Scotland became an independent country that the EU would accept it as a member state? Within 10 seconds. Partly because it would spite the rest of the UK? Yes, of course. And, you know, the, the, the European Union elites uh, look at Brexit as a major defeat. They may not say so but they could do consider it a major defeat. Uh, and therefore, they will seize the opportunity uh, to you know, take their revenge on Boris Johnson and the, and the London Tories, the English Tories, uh, by bringing Scotland in. There is no doubt about it. Hmm. So you think the, the view that Spain would veto Scottish membership because of the, uh, the Catalan question is, is a red herring? Absolutely. Uh, Spain doesn't like the idea of Scottish independence, but at the same time, if there is a fait accompli, 
if Scotland is independent and it applies for membership of the European Union, uh, it may take a few hours for the Chancellor of Germany and the President of France uh, to twist the arm of the Spanish Prime Minister, whoever the Spanish Prime Minister might be, but it will happen. Mm. One of the central facts of British politics is that the Leave vote is consolidated around the Conservatives, while the Remain vote is split between multiple parties, Labour, the Liberal Democrats, the Greens, the SNP in Scotland. Uh, do you think this shows the need for a progressive alliance? Our movement, DiEM25, um, in 2017 uh, campaigned for a progressive alliance, even though I am a personal friend of Jeremy Corbyn and a great supporter of uh, Corbyn's Labour Party. Uh, even then, we could see that it was essential uh, not to do stupid things. Like, for instance, you know, when Caroline Lucas, my great friend, Green MP, is running in Brighton, what is the point of putting up a candidate against her from the Labour Party when, you know, Caroline Lucas is completely aligned to the policies of the Labour Party, or was at the time? Similarly, in the Isle of Wight, in other constituencies. So we went out there campaigning uh, in favour of... Um, uh, Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party and other progressives, including some Liberal Democrats, that could unseat the Tories. I think that was the right strategy. Uh, Brexit put a spanner in those works because of the toxic debates between Remainers and Leavers within the progressive camp. And it is important now, and this is what our movement is working towards in Britain as we speak, and I am engaged in some of the discussions as well personally. Um, th this is why it is so important now for progressives, before we talk about a progressive alliance around the general election, to start working together on the ground, at the grassroots, in common campaigns. For instance, to end the surreptitious, uh, undercover, privatization of the NHS, which is you know, proceeding apace and at a very fast speed uh, under the Tory government. If progressives cannot get together to defend uh, the NHS as a provider of uh, basic health services to the people of Britain, then there's no point even in discussing a progressive alliance at the, ball at the ballot box. Mm. Labour's woes are are not unique to it. It's, it's sister parties, other social democratic parties, as you all know very well, are, are struggling across Europe, in France, in Germany, in Italy. Why do you think the social democratic malaise um, is ongoing? Because they are no longer social democratic. They ceased to be that in the 1990s, late 1980s, early 1990s. The social democratic parties of um, Willy Brandt, in Germany, of Bruno Kreisky in Austria, the Socialist Party uh, under François Mitterrand in the 1970s, up until 1983, uh, the Labour Party under Harold Wilson. The way they understood the world was, uh, or capitalism, was as a, um, a, 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 as a clash between capital and organized labor. And their personal role as politicians, as government, as the referee that would step in, impose upon capital a certain level of redistribution of their profits towards the welfare state and towards the workers in the form of higher wages and better conditions, while preserving the property rights of the bourgeoisie of the capitalist class. This is how they understood themselves as referees within the industrial landscape. But if you think about it, if you think of Tony Blair, of Gerhard Schroeder in Germany, of Mitterrand after 1983, uh, they stepped out of this industrial landscape. They realized, quite correctly, that uh, power was shifting from industry to finance, with financialization globally. So they cut deals with financiers, and the deals were very sordid. Every single social democratic government or labor government after the 1980s, uh, effectively allowed the financiers to get away with murder. They deregulated even more fiercely and fast and powerfully than Thatcher had done, uh, allowed financialization to grow exponentially uh, in exchange 
for a few crumbs off the table of the financiers that went to the NHS. So, for instance, yes, it is true that Tony Blair sent a lot of money to the NHS, but that money came primarily from allowing the City of London to go berserk uh, and, you know, to build huge pyramids of toxic uh, money, private money or debt or CDOs, call them what you, what you will. So when these houses of, of cards collapsed in 2008, uh, the Social Democrats in power had neither the analytical power nor the moral authority to call the bankers and say, you know, <laughs> you destroyed the world as we know it. Uh, we're going to save the banks, but we're not going to save you. You're out. We're nationalizing the banks and you're completely out. Uh, we are going to run them as public utilities. And then maybe at some point we can privatize privatize them again, but not with you at the helm. Instead of doing that, what the Social Democrats were, did, and especially in Germany, who introduced austerity in Germany? It was the SPD. Who introduced austerity in France? It was the Socialist Government of Mitterrand after 1983. Who introduced austerity in Greece? It was the PASOK Socialists uh, in 2010, 2011. Who introduced the notion that now we are printing money to give to the bankers, we are, we are going to have to tightened the reins. It was Gordon Brown. So, in other words, they became a spent force. They lost all credibility and they have no historical purpose anymore as a social democratic movement and therefore they're not a social dem democratic movement. On a European level, the EU's agreed a stimulus of 750 billion euros, uh, much smaller than, than Joe Biden's, but by EU standards, it's it's relatively large. It's a 4.7% of the, the bloc's annual GDP. And it set the precedent of the European Commission borrowing on the markets um, on behalf of all member states. Do you think this, this is a significant moment for European policy? It's another tragic loss of an opportunity to fix the European Union, in particular the Eurozone. It is, it's a disaster. It's, you know... Some critics of what the European Union has done say that it's too little, that the European Union is moving in the right direction, but not fast enough. I disagree. I think we're moving very fast in the wrong direction. Firstly, it's not 750 billion. Uh, it's 310 billion. The rest are loans. Loans do not constitute a stimulus. So in other words, we are talking about 0.7% of uh, GDP over six years, right? So it's 0.7%, whereas in the UK, you had a stimulus of 7, 8, 9%. In, the, in Biden's America, we have a stimulus of 11, 12, 13%. Compare 11, 12, 13% or 7%, as in the case of the, the UK, with 0.7%. So it's macroeconomically insignificant. But what irks me the most is that it is a fig leaf for covering up the nakedness of our fiscal policy. Let me put it this way. When the pandemic hit, we knew that in every country, in Britain, in the European Union, in America, everywhere, that um, the government had to step in and replace lost incomes, which meant an increase in the budget deficit, which of course meant an increase in public debt. Now, we know that certain countries in the EU, and in particular the Eurozone, uh, were already, already effectively bankrupt, like Greece, like Italy, like Spain, like Ireland. Uh, the level of public debt is unprecedented, already before the pandemic. The obvious thing to have done is to use the pandemic as an opportunity to start unifying at least part of the public debt, to consolidate it at the European level, to say that the new public deficits that will be caused by the pandemic will not fall upon the shoulders of member states that don't have a central bank behind them, unlike the British government or the American government, and which are already too heavily indebted. So we're going to Europeanize that. This should be Europeanized, this debt. They didn't do that. Berlin insisted that there should be no such fiscal union or political union. And in order to cover that denial up, they created this recovery fund as a fig leaf for covering it. It's been a, a fascinating discussion. Um, and I have one final question, which is that there are those who hope or 
some even expect that the UK will rejoin the EU in the future. Do you think that is at all a realistic possibility or is that simply a Remainer delusion? At the moment, it is a Remainer delusion. I personally wish it, hap it happens. Uh, but it can only happen if the EU get, gets its act together. Uh, because, you see, at the moment, uh, with every missed opportunity to create uh, a fiscal union that works, a monetary union that works, uh, with every act of violating the single market in favor of German and French multinational oligopolies, this prospect of a United Kingdom returning to a democratized and civilized EU is getting further away from us. Yanis Varoufakis, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you.